and welcome to another presentation by the London Transport Museum Friends. Our speaker tonight is David Rogers. David, who spent 30 years in the London Fire Service, will say more about his background when he starts his presentation. That presentation is focused on the London Fire Brigade, the London Fire Brigade Museum and its friends, and the preserved Massey Shore Fireboat. So David's got quite a bit of ground to cover. David, it's over to you, and uh, just tell us how many hats you're wearing. Hello, my name is uh, David Rogers, and I'm the, the CEO of the Massey Shore Education Trust, and also chair of the Friends of the London Fire Brigade Museum. And today we're going to be uh, have an opportunity to look at both organisations with me wearing two hats. So just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I started in the in the fire service in 1978 and um, my interest in the, the Massey Shore fireboat, which is what we're going to be starting with this afternoon, as you can see from our pictures, um, started around the early 1980s when I, as a young um, fireman stroke firefighter, as we are now, um, read an article that was written by one of the crew members of the newly formed Massey Shore Preservation Group. Um, in the London Fire magazine. And in there, they were explaining about the history of the boat, how they were now looking for volunteers. And within a short space of time, I got in contact with them and very quickly was uh, incorporated into the group as one of their very young members. Um, the group itself was founded by several people who were, have been connected with the boat for many years. And one of them happened to be a, a Dunkirk veteran but more about that story later on. So during the um, my retirement from the fire service after 30 years, um, back in 2008, um, I also uh, became involved with the Friends of the London Fire Brigade Museum. Um, I'd been a volunteer at the museum as well during the latter time of my time in the fire service and also early retirement. So this was the person, Captain Sir Air Massey Shaw, who um, the boat is named after. Um, and then just to explain the information that you see in front of you. So superintendent of the London Fire Engine Establishment. Just to explain how the organisations worked. In 1861, there was a fire in Tooley Street in London, um, of which um, unfortunately the, the former head of the uh, fire service in London um, was killed and Massey Shaw became the new, um, at the age of 32, the new head of the London Fire Engine Establishment, which later, as you can see, morphed into the Metropolitan Fire Brigade in 1865. So a little bit about Massey Shaw, because he's looked at in, in modern eyes as one of the founding fathers of the modern fire service in the UK. The guy that he replaced who had died in the fire at Tooley Street was a guy called James Braidwood. And both their ideas uh, go forward to putting in the, the sort of building blocks of what we do today. So Massey Shaw himself was born in 1828. And uh, this is one of the pictures of him as a young man. He came to London at 32 after um, an interesting background. He's, um, he was a second son in a middle-class uh, Irish background family and normally the second son ended up as a priest um, but he had other ideas and after some uh, his passing his education he decided to disappear off as a seafarer, joined a crew of a boat that went across to America and he spent some a few years in America and that's where he actually started to see Perhaps where his new vocation would be when he came back to uh, to Ireland and later to London, because he attended several uh, major fires that were happening in New York and then again in Chicago, and he saw the fire service in operation there and thought, hmm, that may be a career for me. But he came back from uh, from America to Ireland, and eventually uh, managed to get a commission. Um, in a military service as a captain. So he bought his position, as you could do in those days, and um, became captain in the 10th Cork Rifles. There he saw a bit of action in Ireland where there were some troubles and they were sent up to, to uh, Dublin 
to to deal with it. And while he was there, he also saw the he went to Belfast and saw the, the fire brigade there. And in fact, um, uh, he decided to um, finish his commission with the uh, in the army and answer a job advert in 1861 to become the chief of the Belfast Fire Brigade. Now, the fire brigade at that time in Belfast was quite small. They only had four fire engines, but about 20 men to command. But that was certainly stood him in good stead because in 1861, he answered the call, an advert once again, for to promote himself to London and to apply for the vacant post of the superintendent or chief of the L London fire engine establishment. Now their fire engine establishment had been running for a number of years and that was a culmination of all the insurance brigades or the vast number of the major insurance brigades who were put together to form this united group. Beforehand it was firefighting was done by insurance fire brigades. It was very hit and miss. If you didn't if you weren't one of the paying members of the uh, insurance, so the plaques that they put up on the wall that you can still see in some places today, the fire brigade wouldn't attend. So, um, and also, of course, the other thing about them was that they didn't carry any big ladders to rescue you. So if you were above the ground or first floor, then you had to rely on another organization to come and rescue you by a ladder. The fire brigade didn't carry ladders at that time, but more of that later on. So, Massey Shaw took over. He was successful in his interview and became our youngest ever um, chief officer um, in 1865. Um, and at that time, he also came to meet um, a number of prominent people uh, in London, which helped him develop his passion for improving the fire service. And one of those people just happened to be um, Bertie, the Prince of Wales who, apart from many of the other stories you may have heard about him, had an interest in firefighting. And actually, Massey Shaw and he would go to fires together when Bertie was in London. And also that helped him to get uh, access to people with money who were able to invest in the fire service itself. So Massey Shaw had an agenda which he'd uh, had seen and started in America about how to improve the fire service. And the key things that were happening in London at this time was they were having a major fires in particularly in theatres. Now, theatres were an interest particularly to the well-to-do people in Victorian times because that's where they went to enjoy themselves. But there have been some major fires caused by a lack of actual um, fire regulations in the buildings etc particularly behind backstage where they had lots of uh, uh, inflammable materials and there wasn't any way of protecting the building from these major fires so one of the key things that Massey Shaw started to do was to carry out an inspection and he got a royal warrant to do that um, from his connections obviously with um, the Prince of Wales to visit various places and to come up with an idea and that basically culminated as you will find to theatres today with the, the safety curtain that comes down in between the various acts to stop any fire from spreading into the auditorium. And that's the picture on the left hand side, a famous uh, fire at the Princess Theatre, which unfortunately people did um, die. But on your right hand side, I mentioned earlier on about, about the ladders and you can see from um, the picture on the top right hand side you've got Massey Shaw's picture in the in the in the front there and you've got the picture of uh, one of the escape ladders which was provided and he tried to get these ladders to be built and in fact later on in his time he um, managed to get the Royal Society for uh, that actually had the ladders which was the Royal Society for the saving of life from fire um, to join with him to actually provide these ladders as part of the equipment that would turn up to a fire. And in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see the advent of steam. Before that, on the top right, you'll see that most of the pumps that Massey Shaw inherited were of the manual type, which needed lots of people. Um, small manuals were 20 to 30 people. You could go up to a big manual pump that would need 100 people to pump. But with the advent of steam, that a lot of those um, needs to have vast amount of people were 
slowly being removed and steam was the thing that he pushed both on land and also as we'll discover later on on water so Massey Shaw was certainly had an agenda but he was supported by the people with money which was a great thing to see so the next picture uh, looks at uh, Massey Shaw just before his retirement in um, 1879 um, he's now uh, 51 years old and in fact he's had several injuries and so he limped quite badly but um, he was still fit and able to do his job and you'll see the uh, on the picture next to him one of the helmets that he'd introduced as part of the new changes in this fire service now the helmet itself looks quite spectacular um, but it actually serves a purpose it's not just pretty it came from an idea that so when Massey Shaw on his travels because he did move apart from America to Europe he went to France and he went to Germany and he picked up some ideas and this comes the helmet comes from the idea of the French cavalry who had a helmet similar to this you'll notice that the um, the back of the helmet of the curtain at the bottom is shaped so that water would run away from the back of your neck and the cone that's on the top looks quite ornate it's got a picture of a dragon on it but the idea is that it was a, become part of a crumple zone and you might notice there's some rivets on the top and the idea of that was that if you got hit by anything on your head um, like a crash helmet does today it will protect you from serious damage the officers um, had um, silver helmets and the um, firemen had brass helmets and the other beauty about it was that they had um, these were able to be repaired as well so if they were damaged but certainly that was one of the innovations along with the uniform that Massey Shaw is wearing now which is of woolen construction and was uh, able to keep you dry under most circumstances um, which was another innovation that uh, he introduced so certainly during the time that we had as you will see into the next slide the last one regarding involving Massey Shaw himself this is hopefully you can see in the middle of the picture is Massey Shaw himself and in the foreground you see a number of the Victorian ladies and gentlemen who were invited along to on a weekly basis to to see the fire brigade train and this is at the old fire brigade headquarters in Southwark now to the left hand side you'll see the, the back end of an escape ladder and um, to the right hand side you'll see another ladder that's being used and that was one of the ideas that Massey Shaw had was if you like some entertainment but also it was a professional idea that all these people in the foreground had would come along see the fire brigade and were very keen to support them um, so he would actually uh, encourage their participation all the manufacturers of fire equipment were also invited to bring along their steamers and various other equipment and he would show that being used by the firemen there but as you can see they're all wearing the, the uniform that he'd adopted and certainly this brought things forward that the fire brigade now became an, in, an interesting place for people to actually come and engage with our next slide takes us forward to our boat which is named Massey Shore so the boat itself um, as it said was here was launched in 1935 um, Massey Shore himself was interested through his uh, days with the water to actually operate fire boats on the Thames and and the Massey Shore fire boat which was launched in 1935 carries his name before that fire boats were named after different um, letters from the Greek alphabet so you had alpha gamma delta but uh, a change came about in the 1930s when Massey Shore itself was named after the person we've just been looking at so this is the the boat itself which we're going to be talking about in a bit more detail um, coming down the slip from the Isle of Wight um, cows where it was built and hopefully you'll get a feel for the fact that uh, it was designed to to be workable on the Thames so it's basically like a long narrow boat it's nearly 80 feet long 13 foot 6 wide and has a draft that narrow bit at the bottom of, a, of a 3 foot 6 inches so it's virtually flat bottom as hopefully you can see from this picture and uh, this is it the boat coming down a slip after it's had its basic um, fit out and from then on it would go they took it round the coast um, 
into London where it started its work at the uh, in early part of 1935. So the boat itself was designed by the London County Council. Um, they designed two other boats as well, which were built by the same yard, um, J. Samuel White's on the Isle of Wight. And this, the Massey Shore, cost £18,000, which um, in today's term is, is, is a lot of money. But for that, they got the, the boat that they wanted. It had a galvanised hull, which means it was protected for many years to come. And all the equipment that they wanted, particularly the fire pumps. Now, Massey Shore itself um, was the biggest fireboat that's been on the Thames in capacity. So what does that mean? Well, um, hopefully you'll see sort of halfway down the picture, two little circles, um, which is where the water's taken into the main fire pumps. And the pumps themselves would pump 3,000 gallons of water a minute uh, at 250 psi, pounds per square inch. So it's the biggest pumping capacity of any fireboat that's ever been on the Thames, even today. So just to show you what uh, that can do, this is its uh, Massey Shore's first big fire um, in 1935. So it didn't have to wait too long to, spark, to, uh, to see what it could do. This is at Colonial Wolf, which is um, on the uh, south side of the river in Wapping. And here you've got a nine storey warehouse that was full of uh, crude rubber and various other combustible materials. Um, and the, the boat itself was called upon really to assist the, the uh, firemen who were trying to work from the shore side to actually gain access to the building. The problem they had was because the narrow streets, um, it precluded um, having a chance to, uh, to get their um, fire engines close to it. And so the attack had to come from the water. So here you see Massey Shore with its main monitor, which is the water jet, using that um, 3,000 gallons a minute to actually start making a fire break in, in the building. Um, so what they did was they blasted a hole in the side of the, uh, the building and uh, to the left of it, where you see the, the crane part of the building, there was another warehouse which they wanted to, to protect. Um, over 600 firemen were involved during this fire and 60 fire engines and also Massey Shaw and her two sister ships, which they had at the time, were also involved. But the key role was played by Massey Shaw. So they a combined pumping capacity at the time was about 5,000 gallons of water being pumped onto it per minute. And the fire itself um, went on for four days um, and the boat was involved in it. Um, in the insurance report, incidentally, at the end of the fire, it stated that there were in the building next door, in the next warehouse, which Massey Shaw had stopped by this fire break, putting the water to it. There was over £250,000 of tea and other goods that were actually protected and, and didn't actually get involved in the fire. So if you think about it, the £18,000 that the boat cost to build in uh, uh, and then complete was certainly... Um, built um, was, was recovered many times over by this just one fire so certainly a good introduction to the um, to the vessel itself on the on the Thames the next part of our, our um, story for Massey Shore happened five years later um, when hopefully you can see from the pictures and the uh, the heading there the boat was actually involved in the evacuation at Dunkirk. What happened was that the this picture tells you the story really. The black uh, part of the uh, heading there is is that the oil fields in at the Dunkirk, which the boat was actually ordered to go and um, try and put out to assist the evacuation of the troops because it was causing a problem for aircraft and also shipping. Um, so the crew themselves are all volunteers. Um, and as you can see, Massey Shore itself, this is a, an artist's um, uh, depiction of the, 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 the boat itself, um, completely open at the wheelhouse. That's the guy in the middle there. It's um, so that whoever was steering the boat had all the spray from the water, but also was under attack by um, enemy aircraft as it did. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any pictures of the boat actually at Dunkirk itself, 
and so this is uh, an artistic uh, artist depiction of what the boat would have looked like with its uh, troops on it so the boat itself because it's flat bottomed as we saw in those earlier pictures um, it was able to get close into the shore so that a lot of them the soldiers that were rescued and the boat itself is credited with being rescued over 600 troops from the beaches and uh, ferrying them to some of the larger craft that uh, were waiting in the deeper water and it also brought back on three trips and that's this depiction shows you one of the trips back to the UK with another 110 troops on them so the boat itself was full up as many um, people as possible were loaded onto the boat and it was brought back um, in the engine room which is the the largest part of the boat um, you'll see that the any injured um, soldiers were placed in the actual uh, engine room because that was where it was nice and warm and a lot of these uh, soldiers were suffering from hypothermia and from issues with um, uh, minor injuries so they were kept in the warm in the engine room and that would be filled up to about 15 20 people and we'll show you some pictures of what that looks like it, it, it later on but certainly this will give you a, a, an idea of how the boat would come and on the three trips back on one of the trips they were followed by um, some German aircraft and also one of them tried to um, to sink the boat with a, a torpedo but fortunately it missed and uh, the boat got back safely without uh, anyone being lost the guy who's at the helm at this particular picture is uh, a guy called Aubrey John May who was a, a sub officer uh, one of the junior officer ranks in the fire brigade but he got a lot of um, experience um, in uh, as a merchant seaman and he was awarded the distinguished service medal for um, gallantry at dunkirk and several of the uh, um, original crew were also um, mentioned in dispatches by admiral uh, vice admiral ramsey uh, at the end of in his final report so the boat did a fantastic job it's never designed to go to sea but it did and uh, certainly one of the highlights of um, its career and just to give you an idea of the pictures that we have this is the boat actually coming up the Thames and from that uh, painting you'll get an idea of what it was and you'll see Aubrey John May standing up in just by the the broken part of the um, lamp uh, standard there with some of the crew and you might also notice that they're all holding um, up into the air their Lee Enfield rifles and these were actually given to them by some of the soldiers they should have handed them back um, after they'd returned from Dunkirk in the early June but um, as you can see they didn't give them back um, they were t <laughs> I think they were taken back a little bit later but certainly you can see by the, the state of the boat at the fore part where above the Massey shore um, actual uh, wording you can see the boats had quite a lot of uh, sort of superficial damage but you can also see dangling down from the side of the boat uh, ropes that were made up by the crew and they were used to assist the troops um, to um, pull themselves up um, to the side of the boat and allow access so the boat itself came back in a reasonable condition um, and Bear in mind that it had been involved uh, uh, in um, quite strong seas on a couple of occasions. It, uh, it, it showed that the builders have made a really good job um, in protecting it. So the crew themselves um, came back safely. I so all, all of them were volunteers. And um, of course, like many of the little ships that did come back, they returned to their day job. But unlike some of the little ships which were owned by... Um, uh, people uh, of a personal issue the the fire brigade wanted their fire boat to to come back and obviously got involved with fighting the blitz which it did um, and in particular um, the boat itself was involved in um, December 1940 when um, we had the uh, big incendiary um, raid on London and that's the classic pictures when you've got uh, St Paul's all ablaze or the area around it all ablaze 
And one of the big things they needed was lots of water because the Thames was at its lowest. And that's something that Massey Shaw was able to provide water from a depleted water source. And it was uh, spent um, many hours pumping what water it could to the land-based um, firemen. They, they pumped it into uh, large dams and they used that water to keep um, St Paul's from being lost. So she, once again, she uh, has a, a unique history that um, has protected London for some time. Moving forward from wartime, we, the boat itself was still operational. Um, and this picture gives you an idea of how things have changed. This is into the 1950s, stroke early 1960s. Um, the boat itself is in pretty good condition. Um, as you can see, one of the additions is the wheelhouse. Um, right in front of you there with the, the fireman standing by it. That, this was put on at the, uh, in uh, 1947, just after uh, the return from, uh, from Dunkirk. Um, and it provides the, the personnel inside the wheelhouse, the, the, the coxswain, uh, with some protection from the elements. But as you can see, she's still looking good there and still able to um, carry out her role um, as a, uh, an operational fireboat. Um, she's getting a little bit old now at this particular time, but um, it's still seeing you know, uh, some basic maintenance um, and the boat still kept, kept on going. Um, the important thing to remember is, and something we're going to cover in the next couple of slides, is, is about what the fireboat had to do and how it worked. So in the next couple of slides, um, the first one um, is the, on your left hand side as we look at the, uh, the screen, um, is involving with a rocket gun, a Shamuli rocket gun. Um, these were developed by, um, for the Merchant Navy and also the Royal Navy later on in the um, latter part of the uh, 20th century and involves a rocket being launched by, um, if you look at the, the guy at the foot in the foreground there, and they're doing a training session. So you've got like a pistol shaped um, gun. It's, it's uh, fired by it with a cartridge, a little bit bigger than a uh, shotgun cartridge. And you'll see connected to it is a line made of wire. And from that in the little box that it comes out of is uh, uh, several hundred meters or a hundred meters of um, rope. And the idea was that you um, took um, which the, the instructor is pointing out now, uh, a particular point to aim at. You took in the uh, the weather conditions, I was it strong wind blowing or tidal problems or whatever, so that the boat was still, and then you would try and fire the, the, the pistol. That would send the rocket across to the shore, and then you would be able to pull the hose from the boat um, to the shore and then set up pumping. Now, just to explain that um, Massey Shore itself, um, in its, um, when it was commissioned, would have a mile and a half of um, four stroke five, uh, yes, four, four inch hose. Now, the hose itself was in uh, 50 or 100 foot lengths. And as you can see on the picture on the right hand side, um, apart from using the rocket gun to get the hose to the shore, you could actually row it. And that's what's being the hose that are described as being paid out at the rear of the boat by part of its crew. So one of the reasons why the crew was quite big on the boat, it would normally carry about eight people. Um, four of them, as you can see here, would be involved with getting the hose ashore. If, the, if you couldn't get the rocket gun to work because it was too windy, and there's some great stories, of course, with um, where things have gone wrong with a rocket gun. Um, one of them is in particular where they were doing a training exercise down in, in Greenwich. And the um, training crew had been going through all their um, motions and decided that the rocket would be a good idea to practice. And they fired a rocket off. The wind took hold of it and it went through the top deck of a double decker bus that was happened to go in past down at uh, near the Greenwich um, um, Observatory. So um, it holds a lot of confusion. Fortunately, no one was injured um, and they obviously had to cut the line pretty quickly to stop it uh, being pulled out by the bus whose, whose driver was in shock, as you can imagine. But uh, certainly rowing the, the hose 
ashore as you can see the idea was that all the hose will be brought up onto the deck from the uh, um, forward compartment of the boat and then it will be moved up and down the deck like spaghetti and then part of it would be taken into the to the rowing skiff which these guys have got and uh, it would be then rowed to the shore as soon as possible now the technique was to try and get to the shore as quickly as possible because the hose itself is made of um, of cotton and is a canvas material and so after a while it started to soak the, into the water so it would start to sink and then you've got a great difficulty then trying to row and pull the hose to the shore the other part was of course the tides you had to try and make sure that you rowed with the tide otherwise trying to go against it meant that you and your hose will be pulled down the river now in my early days in the fire service in the early 80s we used to actually have a, uh, an attempt to try and row the hose ashore um, just to get a feel for what it was like um, so as a, a land-based crew we went to um, the fireboat that we had at the time and they said would you like to try it so we yeah, said yes but we weren't aware of course of what the tides were so we got in the boat and we thought right we're all young fit people we can do this and it all went very well for the first 10 minutes until the tide changed and much to the amusement of the fireboat crew we started to disappear down the river being trying to hold on to the to the hose and eventually they had to come and fish us out we all we all made it back onto the boat safely but of course then we had to try and retrieve all the hose so it was a quite an art to make sure that you got this done but it was a way of getting the hose to the shore the outlets of Massey Shore, there's eight of them, so we can run eight lengths of hose and provide that 3,000 gallons of water via the hoses to the shoreline. Unfortunately, um, time marches on and we're now at the end part of Massey Shore's actual operational life. This is a picture of uh, looking quite sad really in 1971. And, and the guy in the foreground her last actually operational skipper, the person in charge of the, of the boat itself. Um, this is uh, in the background, you've got the, the Albert Bridge and the boat itself has just been uh, decommissioned and left on a mooring um, to await her fate. Um, always a sad thing to see when the boat comes to the end of its life, but for 36 years, which is very unusual for any fireboat in London to, to operate, um, she'd been able to provide the service. But at this particular time, she was um, lots of money needed to be spent on her to actually keep her going. And why would you need an, another new boat to actually taken over from her? So the next decision that had to be made by the fire authority was to decide what they were going to do with her. And that took some time for virtually um, well, nearly 10 years, eight to 10 years. There were various discussions about the boat. It was left, as you can see, at various moorings up and down the river. Um, but eventually, um, in the early uh, 1980s, um, the boat itself was removed to um, St. Catherine's Dock, um, where it was became part of a national sh um, ship's um, collection. Um, which was run by the the, Marit the early Maritime Trust. So she was alongside various other boats. And um, once again, uh, people were starting to work out how they were going to preserve her. Because of her unique history, um, a number of fire brigade people were interested and they managed to find some support. So eventually in 1982, um, this group of enthusiasts um, formed the Massey Shore and Marine Vessels Preservation Society and, and their main aim was to preserve the boat and keep her afloat um, for future generations. Um, however, the, they hoped that the fire authority would just give them the boat um, and they could uh, that would allow them to get various grants and access, but uh, the fire authority were reluctant to hand this boat over because of its history and uh, to a new, an organisation which hadn't had any background. So eventually the fire authority gave them a 50 year lease, which meant that the, the boat itself um, could be uh, operated, but it, uh, 
had caused a number of problems in the early days because um, when you went to uh, organisations to get funding, the, uh, they said, well, who owns the boat? And as the, the preservation group didn't own the boat, they said, well, why aren't the fire authority paying for the money, etc., to to keep the boat in order and to do the various jobs that needed to? So it became an issue for us. And that wasn't resolved until the um, 1990s when um, eventually the fire authority gave the boat on a peppercorn, a peppercorn rent to the society. But certainly um, by then, some of the work had been done. Um, but while she was in St. Catherine's dock, um, she suffered several times when I, when I was in my operational time, early 80s. We had to go and pump her out where the, um, the boat itself had got some uh, leaks and um, we had to try and keep her afloat, which eventually we got some funding which uh, allowed the, the society to be formed. And that's, as I say, at the beginning part of the presentation, I mentioned that's where I got involved with her when she was uh, in St Catherine's Dock. So certainly the society's had a um, quite a chequered history. The boat itself, while it was has been in the society's hands, it moved from St Catherine's Dock eventually and uh, ended up in Deptford Creek, which any of you know, sort of South London um, and that area, um, South Dock, over in the South Dock Marina, that's where she was. Um, money was spent on her just to basically keep her afloat and to keep her in reasonable condition. Um, but certainly by then, large amounts of money were required and um, sp specialist help really to, to restore the boat. And that fortunately came along in uh, 2010 um, when the te when the society um, were successful with a grant from the then Heritage Lottery Fund to restore the boat and to, to bring her back into uh, operational condition. And these pictures are um, some of the work that was done on the vessel. Um, it started off with the boat being lifted out in South Dock Marina and then... Uh, we had to refund because the amount of money that we were given from the lottery wasn't quite sufficient for the work that was needed to be done. So eventually we've got, uh, well, £1.2 million was spent on the total restoration of the boat and some other works that we needed. And that was completed in Gloucester. And the pictures that you're looking at now are in um, uh, uh, Tommy Nielsen's yard down in Gloucester. If anyone knows that area, it's in the uh, in Gloucester dock. And uh, the boat was transported, uh, as we'll see from some later pictures, by road down to, to Gloucester and spent two years being worked on. So why was it transported by road? Well, it wasn't in a condition really to bring her back by water, which would be, was our first idea. Um, and one of the, uh, and transporting to Gloucester was, uh, had to be done by low loader. Now, one of the uh, interesting facts for those of you who uh, may or may not know was how long or how high do you think a bridge is on a motorway? So to give you an idea, um, that was one of the things that we had to debate whether or not the boat and a load and a trailer would be able to go underneath the bridges to get it on the motorway down to Gloucester, 130 miles away from, from London. Eventually, we found out that, that uh, as you can see, if the boat was had all its equipment removed from it, it was 16 feet and four inches high, and the bridges were 16 feet and six inches. So we just managed to squeeze the boat down through the bridges as long as we didn't take any uh, uh, bumps or anything or problems with it. So it was quite a sort of touch and go thing to get the boat there, but we did. And uh, the pictures that you're seeing in front of you now, the main water jet that you've seen in action from previous pictures is in front of you on the left hand side and that's made out of brass and copper and um, the big hole that you see in front there is it is where the engine hatch would be um, and underneath that uh, main water jet there is uh, where the uh, the fire pumps are uh, to the right of it you'll see at the back part of the uh, four branch um, hose um, um, park which was uh, it's duplicated both sides of the boat and that's where we pump our water 
with utilizing those hoses that we've talked about. Um, and this is the, the other picture on the foreground is the new decking that was put on. One of the problems that we'd had was that the uh, fire brigade in its um, uh, way to keep things clean as with any like a, a military organization, everything was scrubbed on a daily basis and polished. Unfortunately, they used a holy stone, which is basically a, a soft set stone that was used on the deck to remove any tar or oils or something that had been spilt on the boat. And during its um, 36 years, the actual um, uh, teak decking, which was two inches thick, as you can see by the planking in front of us, that was actually um, uh, worn away. And in some places you could put your finger through the deck. It was uh, it, it was rotten. Um, but this particular uh, decking, it's, as you say, it's in um, 16 foot lengths, uh, an imperial measurement, obviously, two inch thick um, teak. Um, we had to try and find it. Um, now we could get metric teak, um, but that was um, at 15 foot to 10 inches. So we had a two inch gap um, every time we put a plank on. And this particular planking um, took us um, nearly 14 months to find uh, because we had to uh, comply with the um, lottery and governmental issues about Burma, which is where the teak would have originally come from, that uh, had to be uh, uh, carry various certificates, which meant it was more expensive. And the teak that you see in front of you there on the picture cost £80,000 to actually uh, um, buy. And we found it in a, a yard in Holland, and it had been sitting there for 40 years. Now, the beauty of that was that um, it would be an imperial lengths to cut, which meant that we didn't have to worry about the issues with the 14, the couple of inch differences from the metric. But the other downside was that the, the teak had hardened over that 40 years. And um, for those of you who are um, wood connoisseurs will know that once teak's hardened, it becomes very difficult to cut. Um, and in fact, we could only get three cuts um, for each of the lengths that we had using diamond cuts um, uh, for our, on our saws uh, before they were actually blunt and we couldn't uh, cut any more. So it was, became quite expensive to keep uh, replacing the, the cutting material, but we know we've got very sound decking, um, uh, which was used throughout the boat. So we're very pleased about that. So one of the major parts of the restoration was the actual engine room and fire pumps. And here we're looking from the stern of the vessel, looking forward. Um, both of the engines are in, are in the foreground. Now the engines on the boat are um, twin um, eight cylinder Glenifer diesel engines, which were built in Glasgow. They're 160 brake horsepower each. And they um, basically are connected directly into in the darker green, the Merriweather fire pumps. Now, all of this system was um, designed by the uh, London County Council to um, show how the uh, for this particular vessel to operate. So the, the engines and the, and the fire pumps sit very low in the boat so they can get water at most, uh, even at low tide. Um, and then moving forward from that, you've got like a crossover piece, which is in the darker green, and that's where both pumps can be put uh, into operation to pump to the main um, jets, water jets, uh, or we call it the monitor, up on the on the deck. Now you may see on the top left hand side some red pipe work. Well, that's connected to um, two further outlets that are on the actual um, deck, and that allows the the boat to actually suck in water. So they thought of uh, if you had boats that were sinking or had to be salvaged, um, we can actually use the uh, the fire pumps setting the valves up that you see dotted around. There's six valves on each of the uh, fire pumps. We open them up in an order and we can suck water in on that red pipe work, um, utilising a special hard suction or reinforced hose and then pump it out through the monitor. But the engines themselves um, basically are diesel operated and um, if you imagine in the earlier 
part of the presentation, I was talking about the engine room being used as a sort of a first aid post for the injured soldiers. This is it basically. So either side of the engine and down the, the actual walkway, they would take up to 15 people in here, which is uh, quite tight, but they, uh, they found that they could um, keep them warm, that they could uh, feed them and they were in a safe place. Now, just to uh, at the end of that uh, picture, you'll see in front of you are the main fuel tanks. There are three, a large one at the bottom, um, which is the white uh, part of the tank that uh, carries most of the fuel. And then above it, you can just about make out maybe there's two smaller daily tanks. Um, the boat itself is designed to have enough fuel to operate for um, 36 hours in constant use. So to give you an idea, to go back to, to, uh, to, to Dunkirk and back will probably be about half a tank of fuel with these engines operating at their normal running speed, which is about 750 revs, 800 revs. So it's quite a low revving set of engines, but quite powerful. So we normally have two engineers in here and you'll notice that there are two little posts that are, are up, brass posts either side at the end of each of the engine. They're the starting um, uh, posts that uh, are used to um, to get the engine to spin over because so it has to it starts on air. So we've got uh, where where the, the picture is taken is a, an air compressor that started up on a small um, donkey engine, as we call it. Um, that gets to work first of all. And then we use those posts to, to bring them forward, helps uh, an air starter to spin. And that's spins the main engines over and away she goes so certainly it's a um, quite a straightforward operation but this was all completely restored as part of the work so we then um, had the once the work was completed in Gloucester we then had to do the reverse which was to bring the boat back and just to give you an idea of what um, that looks like so on the left hand side you'll see the boat itself strapped onto its trailer bearing in mind it had come a similar way um, down to Gloucester this is now leaving the yard and as you can see by the uh, the guy with the uh, hazard jacket on there's very little room and space to actually get the trailer out um, and quite a big overhang of the boat itself but you'll see in the uh, where the strap is to the, uh, the front of the boat you'll see once again the intakes where the water's taken in and above that, all the decking, etc., has been removed um, and it's kept to a bare minimum so that when the, uh, the boat can obviously travel safely underneath all the bridges all the way back. So it was certainly an impressive um, hand on heart moment for when the boat's being removed. And the other next picture is shows you um, its return um, before the boat could be put back in the water in, in its new home in West India Dock. It had to have the wheelhouse and all the associated equipment back on so that um, it could be passed. So the, the crane, there's a 200 ton crane um, that followed up and met us in the in the dock. And once again, another heart stopping moment is lowering the boat back in um, after all the work that had been done. Um, but fortunately, she uh, was safely placed back into the water. Um, and this is a new home in West India Dock where she... Um, still is today but we're very pleased that the, the heritage lottery funding allowed us to do this work um, otherwise the boat would certainly have been lost and that happened she went back in in 2013 so that was it so what happens now well the, the part of the project which um, we'd signed up to with the lottery was to apart from rest restoration of the vessel was to keep on with a, a, a historical um, background with education um, and that's um, that's why in recent times we've changed the name of the organization as a trading thing from our very long-winded um, title of the Massey Shore and Marine Vessels Preservation Society we now trade as the Massey Shore Education Trust because that's actually what um, we're about and so to do that we engage with various partners and one of those partners happens to be that these young people from the, the fire brigade. We have the fire brigade fire cadets. Uh, and this was a, 
one of the earlier events that we got involved with once our returned. This is at the um, picture taken at the Fire Brigade Pontoon in Lambeth um, when the boat was doing a display with um, one of the current fire boats at the time. And the young people there uh, raised a uh, £1,000 plus from um, a, a particular appeal that they undertook for us. So one of the things that we're involved with is obviously engaging with young people um, to try and give them a, a feel, particularly for the fire cadets, about the maritime side of firefighting. Um, they do a course on land. That uh, and These are um, basically um, young people who come across from all, all uh, backgrounds throughout London and uh, we provide them with a 12-week course that uh, gives them an education about uh, the water and about how firefighting is carried out and they learn about the history of the boat and we're hopeful and we're working towards now some of the older ones who when they're 18 become adults of course um, that they would now start to think about becoming crew members because one of the things that we are desperately short of is, is uh, young people and volunteers so we are ever hopeful that um, and it seems to be moving forward that we can engage with these young people to come and help us to crew the boats and to secure its future so here, this is a group of uh, young people who've completed this job up on the fore deck and it was uh, we now have uh, waiting to start a new course hopefully sometime later on this year with another group of young people so it's a um, an ongoing process where they come to us, learn the skills. And so far, the feedback we've had has, has, has been really good. One of the things we were uh, keen to do, and we did for uh, the last time the boat um, went back to Dunkirk, which it does on a fairly regular basis, was in 2015. The 2020 course, um, fortunately, was um, trip was postponed because of the pandemic. But we're hoping in 2025, in May, we're due to return to Dunkirk with the little ships. And we're hoping that some of these young people will come back with us as part of our crew. So we look forward to that. Uh, but they've got to be trained, first of all, to continue that. So just to give you an idea of what we're up to in more recent days, this was some shots, a shot taken from last year when in between the pandemic, we managed to squeeze in a, an open weekend. Um, this is in our berth at uh, West India Dock. This is actually in the lock going into the dock. That makes sense. And behind us, you've got Canary Wharf and the new Wood Wolf that's being built as we speak. Um, the monitor's in operation. We've got uh, one of our engines working because unfortunately, before the pandemic, we went up to Ipswich with the little ships and one of our main engines um, decided to uh, to play up and call, and we've had to, um, one of the heads broke. So we had to uh, strip the engine down and uh, we're slowly now getting back to the stage where we can actually engage and get the uh, both engines working. But this is one engine working. Um, we had a, a fantastic weekend with over 500 people coming from the local area. Lots of them were families. Um, and in behind where the picture's taken are a number of um, houses that are being built as part of the new regeneration of this area. And we're hoping to, um, to engage with them in the future. Um, we're now working with a number of partners, including obviously the, the, uh, the friends of the um, London Transport Museum, your good, your good selves. We've just started some preliminary discussions about how we can link up. But we've got partnerships now with... Um, a number of the local groups, including the Dockland Scout Projects and the Canal and River Trust and the Fire Brigade and also the Friends of the uh, Island Historical Trust, which uh, are based on the uh, on the Isle of Dogs. So we're now trying to um, build up these partnerships. And of course, one of them happens to be something which will be the next part of our um, presentation regarding the Friends of the London Fire Brigade Museum. So with those partners, we're hoping to hold another open day in the summer, in August, and to uh, increase uh, visitor numbers, etc., which will obviously be a great benefit. But certainly we've, uh, we've been pleased that um, we've come out of the pandemic so far. Um, unfortunately, um, as most organisations, 
uh, without a great deal of funding, but we are able to um, continue our partnerships and to get the boat back with that target of May 2025 looming to get the boat ready and operational to go back to Dunkirk again. But we are looking forward to that. So what do we do for, to earn our funding? This is a, a good picture to uh, perhaps conclude this section of the presentation. Um, the boat actually on the river pumping. Um, it is totally unique and we're very pleased that uh, to be able to go out and support other organisations with different events on the river. Um, it, the boat is well known um, and uh, we're very well, very pleased that um, we're able to uh, come out and to do these events. This gives you an idea of um, the boat itself can operate with one engine to, uh, to move it along and as you can see here and use the other one to pump with. Um, the difficulties we have sometimes is the fact that um, uh, with the modern fireboats they can uh, turn their um, water jets on and off pretty quickly. We have as you can see from earlier shots a number of valves and things to uh, undo um, and therefore we have um, we have to sort of lower the monitor as soon as possible otherwise with these bridges here we do a great job of cleaning the underneath but um, lots of birds um, poop and things on the deck is not a good idea but this shot was um, taken the last time we were out um, uh, just before the pandemic and uh, we look forward to uh, returning to um, to getting the boat back in that operational condition hopefully it will probably be next year now but uh, we look forward to obviously taking visitors still and really if you'd like to uh, come along and see us then uh, please get in contact with us so this concludes the first um, section of the presentation regarding the the massey shore society um, we're now going to move forward with the next part which is partners partnering with the the friends of the london fire brigade museum and this is where i change hats um, I say I am the currently the chair of the uh, of the friends, and um, that the next part of the presentation looks at uh, our, how the, the two groups are entwined, and what the friends get up to. So, this is um, the former home of the, uh, the London Fire Brigade Museum, which is in Massey Shaw's old house in uh, Winchester. It's called Winchester House um, in Southwark. Um, this was the home of Captain Sir Air Massey Shaw, who we spoke about earlier. Um, and this was used as a museum um, from uh, 1960 up until fairly recently when obviously the museum itself was closed. Um, the museum itself um, had its early days at the London Fire Brigade headquarters in Lambeth. Um, and funny enough, this is where we come into a, a cycle events. Lambeth is where, as we'll see in a moment, um, the new mu museum is proposed to return to. But this was where um, I started off doing my um, volunteering. Um, the house itself um, was the uh, where the collection was moved to from uh, in 1960. And a um, very impressive place, which uh, Winchester House was. Um, and still is, but obviously the um, when Massey Shaw had it, it was his headquarters. Those early pictures that you recall, we saw as it's at the rear of the building with Massey Shaw and his colleagues would be undertaking a number of um, exercises, etc. And this is where the, the Prince of Wales would come to as well. They came to dinner, uh, he and his wife and family, and Massey Shaw, I say, got on very well with... Um, various uh, dignitaries etc in, in during his period as uh, the chief officer. Um, the volunteering um, in the museum was quite good but certainly by the time I was involved in the sort of the, uh, early 2000s um, the building and the area around it which was the old trainer school was basically um, being looked upon to, to close and the site be uh, sold off in order to raise some funds for the fire authority and the part of my role as a chair was to meet with um, 
the, the leader of the fire authority and the, and the chief officer at the time to discuss about how the museum itself could, uh, what would happen to it. Uh, fortunately, the um, negotiations weren't particularly good. There was lots of um, disagreements and eventually the uh, museum was closed and all the artifacts have, have been put into storage. Um, whilst the um, a new museum site was found, etc. So the, the place itself in Southwark is still there, but uh, is now opened up as a school, um, and uh, the whole area itself, as a number of the buildings behind have been have been uh, knocked down, and various other places built in into the area. So unfortunately, with the house itself, um, it's once again changed. The idea is that the, the new museum will be built here um, as part of a re, sort of a rejuvenated um, eight album embankment. This is the former headquarters of the London Fire Brigade uh, from 1936. Um, eight storey building and the chief officer uh, apartments are at the top and you've got a fire station, as you can see, with all the, the bay doors across the front. Um, and that's still operational as a fire station and part of the, the idea of uh, in the developers ideas was that uh, there'll be a new part of this would be part of the fire station and the piece that you see on your right hand side that would form part of a new museum um, once the planning had started um, unfortunately uh, that the plans were submitted to the local authority to Lambeth council and um, unfortunately over a number of years the, the council has uh, and um, appeals have happened if have, we've have had their grant to continue the planning has been refused so currently the uh, museum still um, languishes as such in in the storage while um, the most recent um, objection by the uh, the minister of state concerned with um, with planning uh, for the building has uh, actually once again been rejected so we're not sure when as friends the museum will actually go back again currently there's negotiations trying to look at possibility of a new developer a bit of finding some interest in the building and being able to actually move the process forward but still no the target was due to happen if the planning had gone ahead um, in the next couple of years but that's now been extended so as friends we are now looking at um, having a, a virtual museum because the, the museum itself uh, and the friends have been working hard to try and make things happen um, but certainly as the friends organization as the chair this is part of our timeline and that changed last year when after a long time the uh, the fire brigade um, and ourselves set up a memorandum of understanding um, and that's an opportunity for the friends to actually get official recognition um, before that the friends were uh, operating basically as a, as a, a group that were involved in um, supporting the plan but more of a um, uh, an a place where group themselves would uh, turn up at events but didn't have any official recognition and that's what we were planning to uh, to move forward to this time as you can see there we have um, we've achieved that and uh, that's mainly been thanks to the efforts of um, Saskia uh, Baldwin who I'm sure some of you will know from as a uh, involvement with the the friends of the uh, uh, London Transport Museum she's now head of branding for the LFB and we've had some very productive discussions with her and her and the museum team um, to actually move the, our processes forward. And we're hoping in, in the, this coming year and um, subsequent years that we can work together to forward the, um, the museum. Um, it's, it's likely to remain a virtual museum for at least a couple of years until the planning permission um, has happened. But in our uh, memorandum of understanding, um, these are the main aims that we're looking for. And 
hopefully with all friends organizations will be uh, have similar objectives so we're looking at to celebrate the, the brigade's rich history which hopefully you've seen already just with one part of it with the fireboat is uh, is significant um, and we're looking at trying to uh, move that forward to raise the profile of the museum and its collection um, many many hundreds of thousands of pieces of uh, of the archive um, we've got various parts of um, the collection as well going really from a button to a fire engine um, number three is to look at the mu keeping the museum um, enthusiasm um, through social media and events and marketing as you'll see from the subsequent pictures that that's a big part of which the, the friends are trying to build upon now and the final part there is to to work with the museum to maintain conserve and enhance the collection protect the collection to ensure it's available for public uh, now and in the future so those are the aims that we're working to there is still lots of work to do but certainly the friends themselves are confident in getting that making that happen so this is some some pictures of what's been happening in recent times in between lockdown um, my uh, deputy chair is on the left hand side there with Gary um, and these are some of the guys that we've met some of the firefighters at stations um, the stations and fire stations there's 102 stations throughout London and um, with the friends are very uh, keen to uh, support their uh, open days uh, and um, we've had the opportunity to attend some of them um, on the right hand side you see Gary and this is one of the um, uh, the dogs that's uh, utilized um, as for fire investigation uh, you may notice the dog has um, little boots on they're made of Kevlar so it protects the dog's feet from glass and from hot embers etc and um, they, uh, the dogs themselves are, are based at uh, Dowgate Fire Station in the City of London um, and they uh, are a key part once again of um, protecting Londoners by finding out uh, um, how the cause of fires particularly if it's used with inflammable uh, materials like petrol or various other substances and the dogs um, come along and add uh, a particular uh, unique sort of style of things at, at the open days but as you can see by the banner itself um, that we have uh, the friends have a number of displays and dependent upon the fire station etc we um, are able to provide um, various pictures and support to the museum and to keep that general interest going as much as possible because people um, although the museum will be some time away that's um, enthusiasm still needs to be there and obviously fundraising as well to to keep things ticking along so here's another picture from uh, an event at Chingford fire station um, where the uh, station themselves were demonstrating their the kit that they have um, fire stations um, and also fire boats as we found um, are, are of interest to the members of the public they like to know what's going on behind uh, the land-based stations between behind those red doors and it's something that we uh, are trying to attend as many stations as possible and provide something quite unique for them so this is some part of one of the displays and just to explain the pictures that you see on your left hand side there were unique to this particular station um, with a number of uh, pictures of um, the area um, that the uh, came about from the archives of, of the friends lots of the friends we have are have been ex firefighters themselves others are particularly interested in photography and various other parts um, have got uh, fire engines themselves or other memorabilia so we're able to provide our own unique um, take on um, the fire service and that's really helpful to be able to do that um, so that each station has its own unique history and we can offer that to the stations themselves when we come along so there's another shot of um, some more recent uh, events that's at Chingford um, with, with Gary and the team so we've got people who came along and they dress up and um, in various fire kit that they could that have got in their supplies so we have um, you know interest in, in keeping that going forward and 
this is a shot um, of some fire helmets and various other displays that we put on. We always find people love to dress up, whether they be young people, young children, but also adults as well, and to show how the fire services move forward and the type of things that the museum carries in its exhibition. Uh, the young lady on the right hand side is one of our um, fire cadet instructors. Um, she has uh, was also one of the team that came with the Massey Shore uh, crew um, to do some training with us as a marine unit and she's quite keen to um, move that forward and hopefully join us in 2025. So as you can see there is a, a blending between the various uh, groups that we have. We like to work in partnership with people and that's what we're intending to do uh, throughout the coming year. Finally, just one picture um, to explain the history, if you like. Um, on the left hand side, you'll see um, a shot that was taken at the at Southwark, at the uh, Massey Shores former home. And this is a thing called a hook ladder drill. So hook ladders are those ladders that you see going up the building. They have a bill on the end of them. So if you imagine like a bird's bill. Um, that allows you to go through into open windows and climb up. These um, were particularly uh, still used in France in the uh, Sapa Pompierre, and was another idea that Massey Shaw brought across with him from, from Europe. Um, certainly when I joined the fire brigade, um, we still use these ladders until the early 1980s. And this particular type drill we used on drill towers which you see on some stations to go up and down and a number of rescues were carried out utilizing these ladders but as you see there's no safety um, equipment there if you fell off the ladder it's a long way down and it's concrete that you're falling onto so um, it certainly focused the mind to make sure that the ladders were in being used correctly and on the right hand side you see a, a more up-to-date picture this is once again in, in Southwark's yard before the um, the fire station and the uh, Winchester house was uh, was sold. So these uh, firefighters are going through uh, part of their basic training utilising hose equipment. So thank you. Um, we've come to the end of the presentation. I hope you've found it of interest and I look forward to um, answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, David. You've covered a tremendous amount of ground in that presentation. It's really good to see how you've been involving young people, the Fire Brigade cadets, in what you were doing with the Massey Shore Fireboat. So here's to a successful return to Dunkirk in three years' time. The London Transport Museum friends hope to visit the Massey Shore uh, later in the year at your kind invitation, uh, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, it looks as if we may have to wait a while longer before we're able to visit a reopened London Fire Brigade Museum, uh, but we wish the museum and its friends success with that once the current planning issues are resolved. Now, looking ahead, uh, we hope to be back live at Covent Garden for the talk on 9th May on the subject of the transport in the Isle of Man. That talk should also be broadcast live on YouTube as it happens, or of course, you can catch up with it later at any time on YouTube. My thanks to everyone for watching. Thanks to David for an excellent presentation. And of course, if you're not already a member of either the Friends of the London Fire Brigade Museum or the London Transport Museum Friends, please do think about joining us. The details of both organisations are on the screen. <laughs>